Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Session 2 Reminders and Homework Review presentation, Jesus revises and provides reminders from the Removing My Unloving Self two-day session and reviews the homework of the participants. Recorded on the 27th of May, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. We might as well get started, all of us are here, so... Five minutes, if I can get five minutes, <laughs> you know... <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. So everyone feeling quite good this morning? Yeah, still feeling a bit more open than the third day in? Yeah, today's information really, really, uh, really essential information to understand, and tomorrow too. It will help will help you a lot. We um, and yeah, there's some things that we'll talk about about this as well today. This uh, global refusal of terror. Just identify for you what the terror is about. Yeah, because we haven't done that. If you think about it, have we? No. <laughs> All right, well, let's start, though, by reviewing our previous session, which was our removing our unloving self session. So today, this session is review and homework of that removing my unloving self session that we had a couple of, for the couple of days just prior. So there's three main uh, talks that we gave. The first one was about governing emotions. So... And what do you feel the main points in there were with regard to the governing emotions? So if we start with die on this side and Seth's on this side. Thank you. Um, that the global emotions that affect all of humankind have the most um, impact. Yeah, so when we talk about global emotions, though, we're really talking about an emotion inside of ourselves that, it, that affects everything, aren't we? that if you get rid of that emotion, that it changes your life in so many different ways. Yep. So that's uh, one of the first type of governing emotions. And, and the global emotion, they can be positive or negative, can they not? So what's an example of a positive global emotion? Faith. And a negative global emotion? Terror, fear. So you can see the example. Okay, and what was next, Seth? A multiple event. Based emotion. All right, so emotion, emotions where multiple, multiple events have occurred, and those kind of emotions obviously solidify quite a lot of our belief systems in place, and uh, have a large effect on our false beliefs and our false definitions of love. And uh, a lot of times, it's about remembering them, allowing ourselves to remember them and then to allow ourselves to process them emotionally. And then the other one was single. single, so single events. Now sometimes the single events can be quite intense, can't they? So sometimes they do have quite a, a large effect on us, but, but a lot of the times uh, they're just one event um, didn't get repeated, and so a lot of the times they don't have significant effect on us emotionally. Now bear in mind that these apply to not only what has been done to us, but also what we have done. In fact, they apply more to what we have done than to what has been done to us. All right. And it's what we have done that is very, very difficult a lot of the times to work our way through because we're quite resistive to self-awareness, quite resistive to repentance, and yet that's the largest amount of pain that's been the cause of the largest amount of pain inside of us generally. But unfortunately, we're not aware of that pain. It's where we are unloving, either to ourselves or others, that causes the majority of pain, both physical and emotional pain, inside of us. Okay, so for example, <clears throat> if you're sharing some uh, what you believe is truth with other people, but it's not actually true, it happens to be 
from God's perspective a lie, then obviously that's going to have quite a large negative effect on your physical body and also on you spiritually and emotionally. And that's uh, going to be a large mul multiple event thing that's occurred that you've, where you've sinned, chosen to sin, based on what you've, you know, the motivations you have for sharing what, are, what is untrue with others. And that's going to have quite a large effect on your life and the large effect on other lives, obviously. And pretty much all of us as parents fall into that category, don't we? When we brought up our children, we've engaged that kind of thing. So, so for most of us who have been parents, some of the largest things that we've done that were wrong, we're out of harmony with love, that we need to repent for are related to how we've treated our children because it's affected other people's lives. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we can see positive and negative governing emotions. We've called them governing emotions because they have a large effect on all of our... The key is to not get too stuck up on the terminology. It's just having a lot... These emotions have a large effect on us uh, right now. Remembering that our pain right now is the most intense pain we're ever going to be in unless we do what? Sin. Continue to sin. Yeah. So, so that's a thing we need to bear in mind. So that was the other thing we talked about in Governing Emotions, wasn't it? Which was, what was that about? The, how we perceive and how God perceives what's in our soul. Remember that? Yep. And God perceives things very differently than we perceive it. We tend to perceive the terror as the biggest thing, the, the biggest thing, our resistance to going through emotional experiences as our biggest thing. Whereas God sees our current pain is actually the biggest thing. But we have desensitized ourselves to our current pain. So we don't see it very much at all, usually. It's only when it gets chronic when it's also attached to physical impediments in your body that you start noticing it. And for the majority of us, you know, by the t you know, in our teens and 20s, that, that generally doesn't happen. But by the time we start hitting your 30s and 40s and 50s, then, it, then we start feeling the effects inside of our body. And then we start looking for remedies that are physical in nature when the reality is that the problem is emotional, these unloving events that have occurred. Okay, so there's governing emotions. Then we talked about, what was the next thing we talked about? Deconstruction, Deconstruction of the facade, yes. Deconstructing my facade. Okay. There we talked a bit about the state of the facade, did we not? What was the state, what is the state of the facade? Two things that we need to bear in mind primarily. If we go to jo um, Joanne, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I can't see that far over there. Yeah. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> um, to desensitise us to our pain. So the desensitisation to pain is a, is a really important part of the, why the facade gets generated. And the other thing is, what's the second thing? Um, to um, not feel our terror. Not feel our terror, to not feel our fears. So that being, that being the goal of our facade, you can see that one of the best ways to deconstruct our facade is to reverse those two particular problems, isn't it? Now, before we reverse those particular problems, we're up in this area here, aren't we? And we might need to, we have to definitely get through denial before we'll do that. And we definitely have to probably give up a lot of our addictions before we'll do that. So, so there's work to be done up here in accepting the facade before we can deconstruct it and actually finish up accessing the denial of our pain and the refusal to feel terror. It, it, it's a process of growing sensitivity to what's actually inside of us. So for the majority of us, we're not even aware that this is inside of us from a cognizant perspective. We've, we've been told it's there, but doesn't mean that we personally believe it's there. And then for many of us, a lot of the pain, we're not even aware is there either. A lot of it we just think is normal life. Or for many of us, we think it's actually pleasure that we're receiving when we're in the addiction, of course, com comfort stage. 
and therefore very, very much ignoring our pain. So, so it's going to take a process of a developing awareness in two major areas. The first major area is intellectual awareness needs to develop. So we talked about that. You can't change something and let, if you're completely in denial, including intellectual denial of a problem. And then, and then we've got to also go through the process of developing the emotional awareness and the emotional deconstruction process. And remember, we referred you back to the 2014 stuff about deconstruction. So my suggestion is to go back over that material and understand it. Most of you had a lot of difficulty understanding the deconstruction process when we presented it. So that means that, you know, this is not the part you're up to yet because once you start going through it, you understand it pretty, pretty easily, you see. So... So this also tells us that the majority of us are still in the accepting the facade stage. Yep. Okay. Alan, you would like to... Um, if you're sobbing and crying and praying about a childhood event is and you're in that space for 40 minutes an hour is that part of your soul accepting a terror based emotion well it could be a number of things you could be going through some pain you could be releasing some false beliefs that you have yeah you could be feeling some terror about it and usually it's quite a seamless process once you get into it the key is whether you're actually crying about it's really just a tantrum or whether it's actually a childhood emotion. Yeah, I've noticed I, I swing between the effect of how it's, what it's done to my life, how it's affected my life yep. from that event. Yep. And, and I s tend to swing between the effects and then feeling the actual event as it was as a child. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just wondering more about that. Yeah. So you're, you're like you're moving up and down through it, I suppose. Yeah, a, a lot of it depends. You, you see, unless we get rid of this, we're never going to feel these childhood emotions like significantly right. sig enough to change. We have to get through this part as well. And, and so we do need to identify what this terror is about, yep. don't we? Yeah. You can see that we're going to have to... Obviously, we do need to feel it and... and and actually, if you felt it, you would know what it was about already, right? But it's interesting that the majority of us haven't even really at this stage considered what it's about. Like it's just mm. there and we know it's there and every time we hit up to the block, we start trembling and we run away and we do all sorts of things to avoid it yeah. and all of those kind of things. So this is a the, – the deconstruction process involves doing some things up here with your addictions and your denial – but also involves starting to settle with emotions that are related to allowing the feeling of terror to exist inside of you and feel it, and emotions relating to allowing the feelings of pain, emotional pain in particular, to be present and to feel them instead of denying them and pushing them away and pushing them down all the time. So the deconstruction process does involve a large amount of range range of work if you like yeah, right the way from recognizing your anger when you don't get your addictions met and recognizing your comforts you know how you're manufacturing comfort in your life all the time and how you know you know just a even just things like little changes in temperature if it's, if it's a little bit too hot you're uncomfortable and it's a little bit too cold you're uncomfortable and and how you manage that in your life that all has a large effect on what I, I can on. see that I, I lack the true examination of all those things you just mentioned mm. and I'm just starting to connect, yeah, that, that lack of faith around that, yeah. Yeah, I've had to be very honest about why I do things, you know, and sometimes you, you do things, things you think you like, like, you know, many of you might like going down the beach, for example, um, but, but quite often we do something like that in order to to get away from something else. Does that make sense? And, and we're not honest about it. You know, it's like how, what kind of foods are our favourite foods, you know? Quite often they're our favourite foods because they help us get away from something that we're trying to run away from. 
they're not they're not really a favorite food and once you get rid of the emotion that you're trying to run away from you're not that attracted to that food anymore yeah yeah thanks things like that happen frequently so th this is uh you can see that this self-awareness process which is a part of accepting the facade having the awakening to sin is really a lot about becoming really quite self-aware isn't it and and being responsible for your own self-awareness no one else is responsible for it you are responsible for it right? and developing this desire to be aware like, one of the things I keep on reminding myself is the beauty of being aware is that you now can make far better decisions. You can also make far more changes in your life once you're aware. You can't change something that you're not aware of. Yeah. So the deconstruction process is, a, is the process of beginning really in... in uh, well, the deconstruction process assumes that you're already aware. So in other words, that you've already accepted that you've got this thing in your facade and that thing in your facade and you're not judging it anymore and condemning it and punishing yourself for it or pitying yourself for it. Um, you, you are completely aware of what's going on. That's the acceptance of your facade process. And then the deconstruction process involves you now processing some of that emotionally and getting to the point where you can sit with and feel the emotions of terror and pain without getting back out of them and reverting back to the use of addiction and, and the use of your facade. Now, as you know, the majority of you are not at that place. You keep, whenever your um, pain or terror comes up, you revert back to your facade very and your addictions very rapidly. So this is an indication that the deconstruction process has barely begun, still in the acceptance phase. All right. And the key is to not condemn you f yourself for where you're at. The key is just to settle with where you're at and then work your, develop an aspiration to work through where you're at. Yeah. And then uh, uh, the, day, the day after we went through this releasing my pain part, We talked a lot about the global emotions, particularly the global emotions associated, the positive emotions we're going to need to develop in order to release it, and the po positive qualities that we need to develop. And, and you can see the role of faith and humility in, the, in that, can't you? It's quite, uh, imp are important qualities. And by this stage, to release pain, you're going to have to have developed particularly faith, humility, and a, and a love of truth. You're going to have to develop those particular things and also a desire for action. Instead of just whenever you're confronted with a bit of yourself, the, the pain that you, that you know is there, instead of just skipping out of it and running away from it, which is a desire to, to, des to use action to deny, what we need to do is develop a positive use of action so we use action to access rather than to deny the emotion to access the pain so the majority of us are using action to deny things at this stage right? and what we need to do is change that into using our action to to engage the process of getting to the state of humility to feel the actual emotion yeah. and you could see from the in the Q&A session there the struggle you had with even understanding that uh, that process right because every question that you asked that you thought was about that turned out being about that <laughs> so so that tells you that still not there yet right still not at that place where you're releasing pain and in fact for many of you what what pain you have released has either been just small snippets where terror is not involved and there's not many false beliefs involved to get to that pain or that the pain you've been experiencing has actually been self-delusional, where you're processing something, but that's not the thing you really need to process. And I notice a lot of you doing that, you know, where you process that somebody hurt you when actually in that interaction you hurt them. From God's perspective, you hurt them, but you thought they hurt you. And so you're processing something that actually is reinforcing your false belief that somebody else hurt you when actually you hurt them from God's perspective. 
So, so I see many of you doing that. And examples of that are things like where somebody doesn't give you one of your addictions and so you have a big cry about it, thinking that they should have and that they don't love you anymore because they didn't give you it. Does that make sense? Now, notice that a lot in relationships, you know, where maybe the guy's not getting the sex he thinks he needs and all the women's not getting the, you know, approval she thinks she needs. And, and basically, both of them crying about those particular things or being upset about those particular things are just being upset about addictions that they have. And they're not even upset about the addiction. They're upset that the addiction wasn't met. So that's way up here still, isn't it? Not even accepting the facade yet. Yep, so we get Karen on this side and Joy on this side. <coughs> I'm just thinking as an extension of that, if somebody close to you dies, um, then most of us, all of us will probably cry because that person has left me. And does that have to be gone through for a while until we get to the point where we see that the crying is a more of a demand cry and it has to change into the other? Yeah, you can see that, you know, if you, you, you know the grieving process begins really with facing the fact that you're angry. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a well-known fact in psychological circles that that's true, isn't it? That, yeah. that we get to the stage where in, we start off in denial, where we deny that there's a problem at all, and then we go through this feeling, we start connecting to it, and we go through this feeling of angry, the person's left me, I'm alone now. Now, all that anger is covering over many addictions that we have, yeah. and we've got to settle with those addictions. And once we start settling with those addictions and start accepting those addictions, that's when we start feeling the real pains, which is, you know, I, I use that person in order to have a feeling of worth for myself and, and so forth, and how dependent we were on that person in order to have worth. And, and these kind of things start getting felt then if we're sincere. Now, for the majority of people who experience a death in their family or a death of a partner, they don't experience those particular emotions and usually you suppress them, shut them down, just have occasional cries. But most of the crying is actually based on uh, their... Basically, they're just in a state of um, rebellion against feeling the real emotions. And most of the crying is is really just a cry, like a tantrum cry, yeah. a tantrum with the world and a tantrum with life and a tantrum with how God created things sort of thing. And, and, we, and it's rare to see people get below that tantrum. But you have to go through the tantrum to get to the other one. You do, yeah. yeah. You do. Okay. So that you can recognise, ah, this is actually, my tantrum is really my demands for my unloving behaviour to continue. That's what my tantrum is. Yeah. My demand. It's like a child's tantrum in a shopping centre or something when they want a lolly. It's the same thing. Mm. The child is tantruming. The, the child has an unloving demand. Love, unloving to itself and now because of its uh, actions unloving to the people around it as well and and this unloving demand the child has to feel the tantrum first and feel the unloving demand and then they might get into what it covers over if they're allowed to but you know most parents usually will discipline the child for the tantrum mm. rather than actually helping the child go from the tantrum into the underlying cause of the tantrum which is more to do with the pain yeah, yeah. And we, as adults, we're the same, you know, when it comes to people having tantrums, we, we, we definitely feel quite self-punishing and about tantrums and so forth, and so we don't allow ourselves to experience the tantrum. But the tantrum's all about anger and rage based on addiction, so, yeah. yeah. Mary used to always say, just go and have your tantrum. Go and have your tantrum, yeah, go and have your tantrum. You need, though, to also be aware that you can tantrum for the rest of your existence. Yeah. So, so you, you know to also see that your tantrum is driven by a desire to not feel what's underneath. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And at some point you're going to need to make a choice to get to what's underneath. Otherwise you will continue tantruming for the rest of your life and the rest of your life in the spirit world too. You know, there's many people who are still in a tantrum in the spirit world. Mm. So you know that's what the hells are for. That's, that's all just people in tantrums. In various, uh, you're doing various things in their tantrum, you know, yeah. to try and get their addictions met. And some of them are very self destructive and destructive of others, but we need to get, we need to eventually develop a desire to get underneath the tantrum, and that requires the exercise of your will. 
Yeah. You um, if I can just clarify something, in order to release my pain, mm -hmm. do I have to have deconstructed the facade or just accepted the facade? To release any type of pain, you have to have deconstructed the facade related to that type of pain. So, so that doesn't mean you have to deconstruct a whole lot of your facade, because you remember your facade is linked to all sorts of different types of pain. But you will also, also have to have dealt with this to a degree, otherwise you won't even go there at all. Right? So, so yes, uh, it's a, it is a process of working yourself down, denying yourself your addictions, and that then brings up anger and rage and going through the tantrum and then getting to the point, oh, my tantrum's all driven by the fact that I want to be unloving. I want people to... And, and it's all about my definitions of love. You give me what I want, what I think you should give me because my, defin of lo my definition of love says that that's what I should get. Right? And once you realise your definition of love is out of harmony with God's version of it, now you can start getting down underneath the addiction and start looking at the pain you're in and so forth and what pain it's covering over. Yeah. So, so I, I've given you very simple examples of that in my life. For example, you know, I used to avoid cats and I remember I mentioned that. I used to avoid cats because they gave me a runny nose and hay fever and everything. Now it's me, that's me just in the addiction of just not wanting the discomfort and so I just avoid the thing that I thought caused the discomfort. Once I started processing through that, I realised, hey, hey, I'm going away from cats because of what happened in my childhood related to cats and my father and his attitude to cats and so forth and the lack of love that happened there. And once I processed that, then I didn't need to avoid cats anymore. Does that make sense? But I, you could choose, I could have chosen to avoid them for the rest of my life thinking it was a normal part of my life. And that's an example of a physical example, but there's plenty of emotional ones. All right, so that's uh, where we're at. We know where we're at. Remember, we had a remember the feedback, the group feedback we gave about measuring where you're at. Was that handy to to see that as well? We, you use those four tools you've got. You know those the four tools of faith, truth, action, and humility and you examine the four tools, and how you feel about those tools tells you where you're at, basically. So for most of us, we feel those tools are faith. No, I don't want to develop faith. That's a bit, you know, I want to stay in doubt. I want to stay so, so that I don't have to take action, you know. And when it comes to truth, most of us are terrified of it still. So that tells us where we're at. We're up here still. The person down here loves the truth, desires the truth enjoys receiving the truth and so forth, seeks the truth with all their heart. Right? A person up here doesn't do that. A person up here s prefers the lie. That's what the facade's all about, preferring the lie. So a person down here feels emotion all the time. You know, they're, they're comfortable with feeling emotion. They, they're okay. They've gone through some of this terror and they're really comfortable with feeling terror even as an emotion. Feeling fear is an emotion. The majority of us are not comfortable with that. So, so we know we're not there yet. The facade is all about avoiding the terror. So, so we know that if we're still avoiding our terror and we're still avoiding our fear, then we have to be in facade. These are ways that we can tell. Okay. Well, let's go through some homework now. There's three questions I'll just get. <clears throat> so the first question for your homework was, what am I currently doing to develop faith? Now, we don't have to list all the things you're currently doing. What did you learn about what you're currently doing? What, what was the thing you learnt about it? If we go to Tara here and to Glenda on this side, thanks. Um, that your body when you're feeling emotion goes through some actions and sometimes you don't know what those actions are doing yeah. for your healing and it just allow your body to feel those. Yes, but I, I'm referring here to in terms of what have you been doing to develop faith, Tara. Okay. So what, 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 what have you learned about that? That's what I'm really asking about. It's all right? You're just, yeah, I'm just... Yeah. Glenda? 
um, that it hasn't worked very well. Yeah, for, for most of you, have you realised that for the majority of you, you haven't done much <laughs> to develop your faith? Have you noticed that? You spend very little time on a day-to-day -day basis developing your faith. Spend very little time taking action in harmony with God's laws and measuring the results. So, so you know, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of the times we see that we're... You know, we talk about these things and we think we really have a strong desire to get closer to God and those kind of things. But, but the reality is when it comes to measuring what we actually do, often what we do is very little in comparison with the rest of our life. We spend very little time on it. Did, did most of you find that you would be lucky to spend five or ten minutes a day on it? Yeah? Yeah? So you can see why we can't have a very strong faith, can we, if we're only going to spend five or ten minutes a day developing it. Yeah. If we go to Janine then. Right. <clears throat> Um, I actually discovered that um, I love um, developing my faith and yep. I actually do do a lot of things yep. to develop my faith. Yep. Um, so I really enjoyed that. That homework. process? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I feel a lot of people um, spend very little time developing their faith, but, but you'll actually find it's a very enjoyable process when you do it. Because it inspires you to do, it inspires you all the time. Like yeah, it does. that's what I find. It's yeah. a, it's a, the more time in a day that you can spend developing faith, more than pretty much any other thing that you do, the more you will enjoy each day. Actually, yeah. 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 And each day feels like it has a purpose. You know how you go through a lot of your life. You know, it's just work here and family stuff there and getting the kids off to school and you know. You know, by the time you've woken up and you've done all these different things, it's midday and, you know, you prepare meals and you, all these sort of mundane tasks. Well, developing faith isn't a mundane task. And you feel, when you do it, you feel that it's not a mundane task. You feel that it's actually a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm very passionate about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's good to be passionate about it. Um, we, yeah, let's go straight back to Karina. Um. Actually, I found the same, that uh, working um, in the morning with the prayer that you gave us yeah. has changed my life. Yeah. Uh, doing it first thing in the day yeah. and developing an emotional connection with all of, all of that prayer yeah. with God. Yeah. And it releases a lot from me, a lot of grief. Yeah. And it's changed my life yeah. and the rest of my day is happier. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. It's always good to do it in the morning, I find, because then the rest of your day you, it tends to be pretty good. But if you don't do it in the morning, then the rest of the day t tends to be pretty crap, really. Yes. <laughs> that's usually what happens. What about the messages you've been telling yourself about faith? What did you learn about that? What messages have you found yourself telling yourself? You want to have a go, Rani? <laughs> That I'm constantly under underlying the met like I'll tell myself something and then I don't see it as a faith. Does that am I explaining? So you're that? undermining your own faith? Yeah, yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How many of you found you're doing that quite a lot? Undermining your own faith? Because the reality is I feel a lot more of you are doing it than that. Undermining your own faith. Yep. And particularly when it comes to fear. That's where you undermine your own faith to a large extent, whenever you're confronted by fear. So, so it's, the, it's the actions in the day-to-day -day situations that you confront in the world where you finish up undermining your own faith a lot. Right. Yeah. So, so, for example, many of you think you've been okay with this, but let's look at the issue of truth, because faith. if you really had some faith in truth... Would you ever withhold the truth from anyone? You wouldn't, would you? And yet the majority of you withhold the truth all the time. Even in your conversation with me, you do it. So that tells me that you know, every time you do that, you're undermining your faith in truth. If you, if you said the truth and watched what happened, you'd be able to develop some faith in truth. 
you'd see its power. You would see it, it's a power on your own life and other people's lives, right? But the problem is many of you, your truth is not God's truth. And so therefore, when you tell the truth, you're really just telling the truth about an addiction that you're not having met at the moment. Do you know what I mean? And that's not telling the truth. That's continuing to lie. Can you see how, how you do that? So many of, you, many of you are telling the truth to, for example, a partner or friends or other people about, you know, this person didn't meet, this, this, this person didn't do this, this person didn't do that, this person did this, this person did that. In each case, most of the time if you analyse it, you'll see that it's all about not having an addiction met and therefore you're really lying to yourself right in that moment. You're lying to yourself. You're lying because you're not telling yourself that it's all about an addiction that wasn't met. The whole reason why you're feeling what you're feeling is because an addiction wasn't met. And you're not telling yourself the truth about that. So you're lying to yourself. Now, if you had faith in truth, you wouldn't do that. You'd be going, no, I feel like an addiction is not getting met here. I feel angry with the person. I feel upset with them. I feel like they did the wrong thing. I have a big cry about it or whatever else you do. But you realise all that's a self-delusion. And if you were honest about it, you'd say, well, no, there must be an unloving demand in me that's caused all that. Now, if you were truthful, that's what you would talk about, your own personal unloving demand rather than what the other person has done. Does that make sense? So, so many of us think we're you know, handling the truth when actually we're still telling ourselves lies about our addictions. Yeah? Very important to understand that. Robert, thanks. What about when someone who's not in a divine, you know, not finding divine truth is having a whinge about something and you know there's one of God's laws in action and you withhold the truth there, you know. Exactly. Like, so you should be just speaking up and saying, well, God's yeah. law states that this is going to happen because of blah. Yeah. Yeah. And why don't you do that? Because you don't have faith in truth mm. and you're also afraid of Worried them. about what's going to come back. Correct. Yeah. You're afraid of them yeah. attacking you. You're yeah. afraid of violence. Mm. So there's two things at play there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So you, you, can you see that if you had re really had faith, you wouldn't do those things? If you really had faith in truth, for example, you wouldn't do it? Yeah. Many of you, many of you people who are not in relationships have no faith in love at all. Right? Many of you who are in relationships have no faith in love either because you, you're just in barter addiction with each other. And that's not having a faith in love where you just give the gift of your love without expecting anything in return. You see? So if you had faith in love, would you do that? Would you, like many of you ladies, I see you closing your hearts. You, you really are still focus on closing your hearts. Right? Now, if you had faith in love, would you do that? You wouldn't, would you? So... So what, what are you doing in a day, on a daily basis to develop this faith in love? For most of you, you're just living in the error. You're not confronting it. You're not exposing yourself to people, to even to your friends half the time. You're not telling the truth to them about how you feel, let alone to a new person. And what about, for many of you, you've got a member of the opposite gender as your soulmate. Are you open to your other half? At this stage, no, you, you're close to the other half because this, this feeling inside is protect my heart at all costs. Now, that is, that is not having faith in love. If you have faith in love, you won't do that. You would work through why you want to protect your heart and you certainly would not continue to do so, continue protecting your heart all the time. You would allow yourself to get hurt. Also understanding that, that you're allowing yourself eventually to love again. And if you allow yourself to get hurt and you cry out the hurt, then eventually you'll be in a state where, the, where, where other people might attempt to hurt you, but you won't feel it as hurt. And your heart will still be open, open to love. So I, I see many of you telling yourself that you're developing faith, but that's not what I see, not what I see in your lives. I still see you acting in the addiction, acting in the demand, protecting yourself, protecting yourself from truth, protecting yourself from love, not taking action, 
uh, not allowing the emotions to come up. So if you have faith, you do those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Liam, thanks. Uh, what about those of us men who are women pleasers? Yep. When so we're not opening our heart either. We're just doing things to receive love. Yes. In the hope that we can we can be loved. Correct. So really, if we wanted to open our heart, we would uh, refuse to, or not refuse, but just say, I'm not doing that in this situation. Well, you'd or, feel if the woman's got an addiction. Yeah. And then you'd realise that if I love my woman. I wouldn't feed her addiction. Yeah. Now, when you don't feed her addiction, she's she's probably going to revert to yes anger and rage. And how do you then feel about your relationship and yourself? And not very good. Not very good. And yeah. if it continues, and I'm still causing that, uh, she'll end up dying of a broken heart. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, you tell yourself a whole heap of untruths which then causes you to go back to your addiction to meet her addiction. Yep. And, and that, that's not faith in truth. That's not faith in real love, God's love, God's version of love. It's not taking the appropriate loving action in the situation. Mm. And it's also not being open to feeling my own emotional pain mm. as to why I do it, what I'm trying to get back from the woman by giving her her addictions, meeting her addictions. Yeah. 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 Thank you. If we come down to Mary. Once you establish faith, can it waver? Um, in Yeah, because otherwise it's a false faith. Yeah, okay. Cause yeah, no, faith, faith, true faith doesn't. Once you've established it and it's based on truth, nothing can shake you. Something to look forward to. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Thanks. Doesn't matter what threats you get, what violence you have, you know, how sad you feel, you know, nothing will shake you. Yeah. So it's a very strong place actually, having faith in God and God's goodness and God's love. It's just honestly very it's a lot of strength in that place. Yeah, you're not not easily manipulated you're not manipulated at all. It's impossible to manipulate you. I so thought I had it after the last assistance group yeah, yeah. and my heart opened to Dave and the relationship started to blossom. Yeah. My mum came to visit and... Why? Because I wanted to talk to her about her intentions for well, giving No, me she, she came to money. visit because she doesn't want you falling in love with a male, right? And so what did you find after her visit? Well, as soon as I saw her, my heart just cramped down and... I became quite panicky and... That's the um, reason why she visited. ...hardened right down. And Dave, I couldn't kind of engage with Dave the way I had before yeah, close she visited him out, for right? the week. That's the only way to get mum's approval, close the guy out. Yeah, no, it was pretty... It was a horrible week. It was yeah. a really horrible week for but her. But important and learning, though. Yeah. Because, yeah. It, because it shows you that actually your attitude towards men is probably not so much towards men but driven by your approval getting the, the need to get approval by women and the reality is most women on the planet do have some very negative views of men and that's why when many of you start opening your heart to your other half to your soulmate in particular you start opening your heart you're going to find a lot of women around you pretty unhappy about that pretty unhappy about it mm. thank you what what most uh, you know most women want in the hills and, and in on earth most women want control of the man, and that's not the same as having an open heart. Right. You can see why historically. So again, we don't judge why historically women have been treated very badly by men, haven't they? You think of the generations past in particular. It's only recent that even a woman's allowed to vote. In many countries, they still can't. Right? So that tells you there's still a lot of work to do on the planet with regard to the attitude towards women. But that anger inside of the woman develops into then wanting control over a man, finding a man who she can get control over and then controlling him. And that's not an open heart. That's not trusting love. That's not having faith in love. Yeah. 
Anyway, we need to move on because there's a few more questions here. What am I currently doing? Let's look at the next question. What am I currently doing to remove my resistance to terror and fear? What, are, what did you learn in that analysis? Uh, Kelly, thanks. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one because I'm terrified most of the time. Yeah. And you <laughs> are I'm doing something, it. aren't you? Yes. You are. And I feel that um, building my faith and God's truth, even if it's small at this stage, yeah. is really developing my wanting to, even though I still don't want to, yeah. um, get to this pain and um, global terror yeah. and, and my own pain. Yeah. And um, so like I was getting excited even just thinking about it. I know that's not anywhere near feeling the terror, yeah. but like there's that, this has really helped me to understand these two areas that I just spend my whole life avoiding. Yeah. And so for um, yourself, Kelly, it would be right to probably say that you've been spending a fair bit of time thinking about your terror yes, now, haven't you? Yes, true. Yeah. Allowing yourself to think, even just think about it. Yeah. Uh, you see, that's better than denying it's there, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, so if you allow yourself to think about it, now you think about, oh, well, it's definitely there. I'm starting to feel that it's there. And, I've, and when I think about it, yeah, there's a bit of fear that even just comes up thinking about it. That tells yes. me there must be some there. Yeah. So now you, the awareness of the what is there is growing. And remember I said yeah. you won't deal with that until your awareness of it actually develops within yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. So that's good. And so if I feel my terror, will that pretty much blow out of the water my false beliefs and definitions of love? Or if I feel my false beliefs, I'll be much more... Um, wanting to feel my terror. This terror is about a few, just a few major false beliefs, right. really. Uh, whereas these false beliefs and false definition loves, usually there's hundreds of them. You know, we were treated all sorts of ways in our childhood that caused us to believe this was love when it's not, and that's love when it's not, and this is not love, but that is. And you know what I mean? Mm. We get there's so many false beliefs right. in here that you're going to need to pick them off. You know, either multiple or single event emotions will pick them off one or a few at a time uh -huh. but but the terror itself usually there's one or two major beliefs there that you know like one major belief that affects that terror you can't trust god most okay. of you believe you can't trust god because yeah. if you were trusting god you'd already be feeling your terror mm. does that make sense so so one way of getting into that is just looking at your feelings about God, letting yourself feel what you really feel about God. And remember we said that in the first group. On the first day, very first day, we talked about how you feel about love and how you feel about change. You know, love, how you feel about love and change and how you feel about God, very much related to this terror. You know? And so that comes then building the faith. Exactly. It sort of goes back to that. You can see faith truth. is so important every yeah. time. Yeah. Faith and a desire for the truth, you know. Yeah. So have some, have a desire to discover God's real nature, yes. God's true nature, yeah. and and allow yourself to feel about God's true nature. Very yeah. important. Yes, because I had um, the messages of positive and negative around that in itself. Yep. That God has designed me to feel my pain. Yep. And be able to cope with it. Yeah. And but at some point you're going to feel that. You know, it's like you've been told that. Yeah. But at some point you'll feel that. Does that make sense? Once you get to trust God and have faith in God enough, and, and in particular have faith in God's goodness, that God's goodness does exist, um, mm. you know, you'll start to feel that. Once you start to feel that, that changes things. It's you feeling that that's going to cause you to get through this. Yeah. Yep. Would that... Oh, yeah, sorry. No, I was just thinking something else about, um, you know, an act of abuse as a child would that one event is part of that global terror? Frequently it is because, you know, we believe those kind of... You know, we trusted somebody, usually, in that circumstance or situation. They harmed us and it's had a large effect on the rest of our life. And so there's a tendency in us then to then blame God for that and, mm -hmm. and to also close down our heart. In other words, blame love for that. Mm. Um, 
And these are, you know, things we're going to have to address if we're going to open to that emotion again. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Thank you. Mm. Anyway, let's look at the third question because we've only seven minutes left now. So now the third question was, what am I currently doing to experience terror and fear? So what did you learn there? If we go to Deidre on this side and Bruce on that side. So Bruce first, because if you say, um, I'm not. Sorry, Bruce first, guys. Sorry, I'm not actually. I'm um, <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm yeah. just trying to smooth it over. Just trying to smooth it over. Yeah, yeah that's what I really. As much as I thought I had a lot of faith. Yeah. Uh, I realised if I have this thing about faith being faith in God. Yeah. But I don't have faith in truth, faith in love, faith in all those things. It's the physical. Yeah. Structure of it. Yeah. And so I really sort of. Yeah, that first question was really big answer. Yeah, the rest of them is pretty. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a controller for yeah. that to control it, so I don't have to feel it. Yeah, so, so I feel yeah, most people could probably answer the same way. Yeah, you, you know, most for most of us, when when we ask ourselves what we're doing to experience it, that's very very different than me just thinking about it now and and all that, isn't it? And that's now me trying to settle down with the emotion itself and. Most of you will notice, because you haven't deconstructed your facade yet and, and you have hardly accepted your facade yet, most of you will notice that every time terror comes up, bang, you're in your one addiction or another one and another one and another one. And it's just like, and, and like I said, you select one after the other if one yeah. doesn't work. And that's a pretty normal. Yeah, well, just last night I was going through that and I kept on going to a false belief. Then I'd go, false belief. Yeah. I, I just, I don't know, I must have a volumes of false beliefs that I just kept on rolling around. Yeah. And actually I thought, am I just, is this all just a facade that I'm creating? Y yes. Yeah, so I'm actually just creating this facade that I'm actually progressing or, yeah, whatever. Is it another facade? And I really sort of had to ponder for that for a while. Yeah. Remember yeah. we said in the first group that the majority of us want to not have faith and the majority of us want to, you know, not believe the truth and the majority of us want to hold on to our false beliefs right yeah. why do we do that because they justify us living here right our false beliefs justify us living here and so we want to hold on to them we want to continue believing them we we keep you know and i hear it all the time and and remember some of the questions that were asked in the first group where i said where during the question i had to interrupt 20 times saying no that's wrong as well and that's wrong as well and that's wrong as well and that's wrong the whole question was formulated based on false oh, beliefs yeah. and and this is our problem is that we're reinforcing our false beliefs up here many of which we have personally manufactured in order to justify our addictions. So it's just that was sort of what the question I was going to ask you then is when you've got, you know, like the Royal Britannica of, of um, false beliefs, <laughs> you know, 24 <laughs> yeah. volumes of them, yeah. what's, what do you, you know, you just get caught in that cycle. And, well, this you know, is where it requires a lot of desire for truth, you see, that, that tool. So when, if you notice that you're getting caught up in false beliefs all the time and you hit them all the time and you notice even that you're using them as excuses, to go ahead 100%, with yeah. Yeah, actions that are uh, unloving, then you know the big issue is truth. So that, that, that means truth, your s desire for truth needs to be developed. And, uh, and so you can focus on that desire, practice that desire every day as well by engaging every single interaction you have with every single person in truth and, and test. And eventually you get faith that truth works. Does that make sense if yeah. you do that? Yeah. Rather than justifying, so, so, so for example, you have a conflict with a guy, you know, one that you told me about this week, you have a con conflict of some kind where, you know, he's raising issues towards you. And um, if you had told him the truth exactly as you felt it at the time, then that probably attack wouldn't have occurred. Well, it would definitely have been shorter. Much shorter. <laughs> Much shorter. <laughs> Does that make sense? But, but because you chose to not tell him the truth because you knew he'd probably get more upset, right? now it went longer and you're telling yourself, this is better. And that's the lie you're telling yourself. Yeah. That's the false belief you're telling yourself. It's not better. It's better that you confront the truth and be done with it. You know? And he will demonstrate whether he loves truth or not by his reaction. Does that make sense? Yep. And then by his reaction, if he doesn't love truth, then you know he can't be a good friend. And it's not that I don't know that. It's just I don't want to. 
you don't want to feel it. Feel it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so you tell yourself the intellectual thing, which is, oh, if I don't say the whole thing here, that is, that's going to be better for both of us. And it's not. It's going, to, it's going to be worse for both of you. Be, you, because you've compromised truth, which is actually a sin. Yeah. Him, because he wants you to compromise truth, which is one of his addictions, which is a, a great, a, another greater sin. And so both of you finish up sinning in the interaction. Yeah, so, nice. so this is where it requires, you know, sometimes when we're up here just, justifying a whole heap of false beliefs to ourselves, we need to start confronting those beliefs in, in actual situations. Thanks. Mm. Okay, well, uh, we've come to... Oh, sorry, Deidre, let's do... Deidre, the last, last one, Deidre. Um, yeah, well, I've actually felt some terror and I held it for 20 seconds, like in 2009. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in my sleep state, I wake up because I've held it for like one or two seconds. Yeah. So I've had multiple one or two seconds in sleep state, like quite recently, like yeah. what I mean recently, like in two or three years. Yeah. But I'm just not even giving myself credit. Like I keep telling myself over and over, I can't survive, but I'm just like, hang on, I'm still here. I and can, yeah, and can you see the can't survive is a false belief well, you're telling yourself. So this is undermining your faith. Yeah, yeah. because I actually have survived 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Oh, it's like it's such a joy to even just discover that. <laughs> yeah, and then find out later you'll be able to survive 30. <laughs> seconds, I mean. Seconds. <laughs> and in a minute, maybe two minutes and maybe an hour and maybe a day of it, maybe three months of it. Yeah, I know. Good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and this is a growing state of, of sensitisation to the fact that you're capable of feeling the emotion. And then you, your faith also grows in God's creation. You're, you are God's creation. So your faith grows in God created you with the capacity to be able to experience these kind of emotions without dying and without having major, you know, mm. without going nuts. Mm. The reality is we only go psychologically disturbed when we deny emotion, mm. not when we fully allow it. Does that make sense? Psychological disturbances, including spirit overcloaking disturbances, are all based upon the denial of emotion rather than the feeling of it. Mm. So that's something to tell yourself too, that actually the truth is that every time I deny the emotion, I'm leaving myself open to potentially going nuts. Mm. And you look at what happens to most people in old age. What happens? They actually do go nuts, do they not? In the sense that they have Alzheimer's or they have dementia where they can't remember their life and they start doing all sorts of what we normal people think, <laughs> and I'd, I'd use that term very loosely, um, think is uh, crazy behaviour. And why has that happened? Because I've spent a whole life in denial of emotion. So that, that's what's ahead of you if you choose to continue denying emotion. So that, that's another truth you can tell yourself, you see. If you, if you feel your emotions and you're honest about those emotions, you, you can't go crazy. You can't. It's only when you deny them, shut them down, try to get a run, run away from them. That's when you're going to go crazy. And if you start using substances to get away from them, like drugs of some kind, your marijuana or other drugs, there's a high likelihood you get spirit crazy. You'll go spirit crazy where you let spirits overcroak you and then they be, live their life through you. You know? Who wants that? Well, a lot of people seem to want that, but... <laughs> It's not very good for you psychologically. You become psychotic under those circumstances. No, thank you. We're going to, at some stage in the future, have a complete discussion, actually, on the causes of mental illness. And it's very interesting looking at causes of mental illness. And, in every, and we're going to try to focus on every single mental illness that humans have defined at this point and, and look at the underlying emotional causes of that particular illness. And, but it's a very interesting discussion. It's one of those discussions we just haven't had the time to do at this stage. And, uh, and you'll find that, yeah, the majority of people have, or even these so-called mental illnesses, are all the result of the denial of one type of emotion in a certain direction, a certain kind or a flavour, if you like, of denial. Mm. All right, well, let's uh, have a break now for 10 minutes. If we come back... Um, now, can we come back at about 11.30 or close to... 
Um, so that's only seven minutes. Yep. Thanks, guys.